So, uh, setting up control limits, well, we need to generate some data from the process, and uh, we then take that data and we apply some standard calculations to it. So we're going to generate some uh, data to get us started. Um, we'll not take 20, just be to, to save some time, but uh, Phil is kindly volunteered to produce some uh, data for us, and Sam, being a specialist in the world of inspection and measurement, is going to help with collecting some data. <laughs> but we, should, we should do for sure, yeah. Nine and a half. So, um, <clears throat> so this is data that we have uh, sampled in a systematic fashion from our, our process. And we put it into to, to mini tab. And I guess the first thing you could do is just uh, keep it very simple, is look at it in a, in a time series plot, if you can uh, remember how to do that. Yeah, so graph and uh, time series plot. So it's very simple, but it's, it's often a, a good place to start. Um, you know, before we start adding the extra uh, clutter uh, of the of the lines that go along with the control chart, which are very useful, but actually a control chart doing 50, 60 percent of the value comes out of just the fact, of the fact that this is process data displayed in time order, which is is replicating what's happening uh, or representing what's happening in, in in the process. So just whatever patterns we can pick up by looking at the data in time order. Is you know, is a top is number one for, uh, for for getting process insight. So this is where we might see um, patterns like shifts in the process, or trends in the process, or extreme values in the process, and all of those things are very strong, clear signals, and we don't need any SPC to tell us that that's, uh, that, that that those things are happening. But it's whenever the signals get a little bit more, more subtle that SPC becomes very useful for telling us how, how our process is, is performing. So, to do a control chart in a mini tab, it's a stat control charts. Now, we are going to look at uh, one particular control chart this, uh, this session, which is called the individuals chart or the XMR chart. Uh, these other charts we will look at, in, or most of them we'll look at in, uh, in future modules. And uh, let's just look at the uh, individual's chart um, on its own. And again, it's distance and OK. So what's your, um, what, what would you say, say about uh, your process if this was the SPC chart that you just generated um, from your, your process data? It's in control, yeah. Uh, any other words for in control? Any other words we could use to describe in control? Um, precise? N no, it's not necessarily precise. It could be imprecise and still uh, in control. Stable would be another way we could describe this process. Um, anything else? I guess we could say if it is in control or stable, uh, it is a predictable process. Yeah. You're thinking about the four I'll states of the process. Yeah. It is either going to be threshold or ideal, because for both of those, they require the process to be stable, first of all. But we can't tell which one just yet. So later, we will get to that. Um, OK, so we can say it's a stable process. It's a predictable process. What else could you say about it if you were describing the performance or thinking about it if this is your, your process? Well, I, I guess, I think really to know if it's wide or not, you really need to, 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 to know the process, to put that into context. This could be extremely uh, consistent and precise, or it could be, it could be terrible. Um, so I don't think we can quite say that, but we certainly can quantify uh, the, 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 the width of the process or the variation in the process. Uh, we can say this process that, uh, on average, it produces uh, a result 7.7 centimeters from the target, uh, but at individual shots, we would expect to be anywhere between uh, 15 and, uh, and, <laughs> and, and zero, and zero, yeah. Well, we'll deal with that little problem of uh, negative control limits for, for uh, some situations a bit later on. 
Yeah, so what we'd expect is that um, because it's stable, it would be reasonable to expect that if Phil kept uh, shooting, that all his shots would be between uh, 0 and 15.68. Uh, and if we didn't have a, a control chart showing that he had a, a stable and controlled process, then there would be no basis for predicting what his future values would be. So it's a very desirable situation for the people and the, the owners of processes to have a stable process because then it's manageable, it's predictable, and therefore we can, uh, we can take management action proactively to manage the process. If it's not stable, we really don't know what's going to happen next. We just have to, to manage on by, by, by the seat of our pants. So really that leads to, to firefighting and, and into these kind of chaos situations. Yeah. I mean, it would have been quite easy. Um, unfortunately, he was, uh, he was very good, but it would have been quite easy to have uh, a shot here at 50. It's almost like it's, it's really looking at the, uh, the internal consistency of the set of data. If something is, is unusual compared to the rest of the data, then it's flagged up as a special cause. Yeah, so no, it, 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 does, it, it, it does work. So once we've uh, established that we have a stable process, <coughs> then, um, uh, and the, the limits are correct because we've only used common cause variation to, to, to calculate the limits, then uh, what we can do is, uh, is kind of project those limits forward in time, uh, do future measurements of distance from the target, and uh, we'd expect to see them all uh, inside those um, limits. If uh, a point then appeared outside the limits or one of these other special signals appeared, then we could investigate that because that tells us something has changed the process isn't behaving the way it, it, it normally does, but otherwise we should leave the process alone. Uh, irrespective of what the customer requirements are or what the business requirements are or anybody else's personal desires are, we should leave the process alone. Uh, otherwise we will end up, um, end up introducing extra variation uh, or tampering with the, with the process. So, um, so the chart we're, we're focusing on is the, uh, is the individual's chart. Uh, it's a good one to start with because it's probably the, the, the simplest one to, to use and to understand. Uh, and it's also a very versatile chart. We, we can plot all sorts of things on, on an individual's chart. We can plot uh, distances from a target, so continuous data. Uh, but we can also plot any kind of data that arises over time, like counts of defects, number of defects per day or number of defects per item, a proportion of defective items per, per day or per batch we could plot on an individual's chart, so uh, it's, a, it's a pretty useful one to, uh, to get started with. Um, as this point says, uh, they're not always the best chart to use for a particular situation, but next time we'll look at some other charts that, that might be better for certain situations, but this is a, a good one to start with.